All right, so um, we're going to continue with how to create better uh, shelter and space for native birds. And um, does anyone know what this uh, owl species is that's peeking out of this cavity? This is a saw wet owl. And I actually don't know that I've really ever seen a saw wet. I think I've only, I've only um, heard them calling. Um, and I, they can make some really interesting noises. They have a quite interesting variety of vocalizations. And often if you hear an owl and you don't know what it is, it might be a saw wet owl. In fact, I think it was during this year during um, the Christmas bird count that we actually had one kind of flying around us like a bat and was making like some really interesting high pitched noises. Um, so uh, we're gonna talk more about snags um, or dead standing trees as they are a really important habitat feature that we can mimic um, in our own yards. Actually, I'm just gonna... So, um, oops, sorry. so um, we are going to talk about, again, um, the next two. So last time we talked about uh, food and water. This time we're going to talk about shelter and space. We're going to talk about, as I said, uh, dead trees. We're going to talk about nest box design, landscape planning, and invasive plants. And um, this is a bird that I was just actually, I was just up in my parents' house and they had a beautiful small flock of adult um, yellow crown sparrows that were probably passing through on their way north. They do not, um, they are here for the winter, they overwinter here, but then they go further north. They're kind of more like considered um, an Alaska bird and um, I'm sure they're on, uh, in um, Canada as well. And so uh, the, up top, I took that picture in Nia Bay on a Himalayan blackberry. That's what they look like um, in the winter. And then the bottom was taken on my rhododendron out front. And you can see that that yellow and the black and that contrast is really standing out um, on an adult um, in the spring on their way as they migrate north. So this is what I promised everyone from last time that I didn't get a chance to make a slide. So now I have a slide. So thank you for that. Um, and um, so the one um, nursery that I was talking about, you'll want to email them um, and get a current list of plants that they have available. And then you can just schedule a time uh, to go pick them up. And that's the email at Shore Road Nursery. And then the other one, I have no um, experience with. If any of you have experience with Friendly Natives Plants and Design, um, please let me know. Uh, but this uh, I found online and I got a recommendation from somebody that I know. And um, they said that they picked up some native plants uh, from, I assume, Lisa. So um, I'll give everyone just a couple minutes to write down that information. And... Hopefully that's enough time. Does everyone, anyone need a little bit more time or are we good? Okay. So um, again, we're gonna talk about shelter and space. Um, of course, we wanna talk about Western red cedar as that is kind of, um, I don't know, in my opinion, kind of one of the most amazing trees um, that we have on the Olympic Peninsula. And certainly were ones that um, were cut down very early on and their wood is so resistant to rot that like if you're driving to the whole rainforest, you can still see uh, old large cedar stumps, um, you know, in the different private um, holdings as you're going to um, the national park. And I was a little concerned because my friend made me a ma mason bee nest box out of cedar. And I was a little concerned and I there is apparently 
some evidence to suggest that insects, you know, don't like cedar as much, but they're still nesting in it. So obviously it's not that, it's not that resistant that they're, you know, totally going to avoid it. So, um, so yeah, cedar chests, of course, do help, but, you know, there's definitely different insects and, and they have, um, oops, oh dear, sorry, I was trying to admit someone. Okay, um, and then this other picture here, this wildlife tree, that's another name for a snag or a dead standing tree, although it's a little confusing because you might think, oh, is the wildlife tree alive or dead? But this was definitely on a dead tree. Um, and this was in Forest Service. This was actually up Palo Alto Road. Um, and that's um, been a route that I've done for the Christmas bird count in Squim. And so um, I just snapped a picture of it and included it because um, I thought that was really cool. And it's not, not a sign that I see very often. So neighborhoods with native plants and complex structure provide abundant food and places to nest. Um, and so cavity nesting birds like the chickadee are um, ones that are very common, birds at your feeder, birds at your bird bath, and also birds that you can get to nest on your property. They're pretty small birds um, and, not, and not too shy. Uh, so this photo, I just, I love this house. I kind of wish this was my house. It is not my house. I don't know whose house it is or where it is. It could easily be here in Port Angeles though. Um, what I really like about it is that it has noticed that on the left side, you've got mature conifer trees. You know, they don't look like old growth or anything, but they're definitely going to provide a lot of good habitat. And then on the right side, you've got a nice stand of deciduous trees. Now those are going to attract different birds. So it is really pretty special to have both of those habitat types. Then if we come to the front yard, you'll notice that you've got a dead standing tree. You'll notice that on the right side of the dead standing tree, there's a nest box attached, which is pretty great. Um, and the nest box design looks really solid. And we're gonna talk about that um, a little bit later. There's also a madrone that's growing up um, kind of in the lee of the, of the really cool looking burned out, uh, probably cedar tree. Uh, looks like you've got some red osier dogwood growing there, some salal, um, which are both native plants. Um, so it just, it looks like a really good um, spot for habitat. And, you know, obviously someone's house is there too. So these things don't have to be separate. We can share our houses and our surrounding property with wildlife, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you can't take that too, too far an extreme. You don't want to like share your house with a raccoon. Um, but, you know, there's certainly ways in which you can provide habitat, especially to birds and bats and bees. So complex structure creates good habitat. Um, this is actually a slide, I think from Texas that I found online. Um, so some of the species don't quite match up, but um, I just want you to notice um, you know, that there are different bird species and a lot of this is relevant um, and could be used here as well. So there's above canopy species like vultures, hawks, swallows, and swifts. Um, and the Vox's swifts have just returned um, from migration. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the um, canopy um, includes um, owls, woodpeckers, vireos, thrushes, nuthatches, tanagers, warblers, and uh, creepers. And then the mid-story um, is you know, where you often find warblers, jays, vireos, chickadees, we don't have cardinals, um, kinglets. The understory, we don't have mockingbirds unless they're a rare bird. Um, we don't typically have bluebirds, but some people do have bluebird nest boxes and there is some habitat for bluebirds. Um, wrens and doves. And then ground cover are um, sparrows, shorebirds, waterfowl, and wading birds, if you're lucky enough to have a pond or some kind of wetland on your property. So um, yeah, this is just a really helpful design feature to think about, you know, if you have a larger property, you know, 
that you want to have all of these um, elements, ideally. So our yards and even houses can provide habitat to native species like the Vox's swift um, through um, leaving old uh, chimney vents open. Sorry, I'm trying to move this. Okay, through leaving our old chimneys open at the top, so keeping the flue shut uh, when not in use. So this is um, what I wanted uh, everyone to be aware of because this should be happening right now. Um, this is the back chimney on the Queen of Angels church. Um, and this, because the Swifts have returned, um, this should be a phenomenon that's going on right now. So at if it's a clear day and it's not too cold out, this happens at sunset. Um, sometimes if it's like a day like today, they might actually go in a little bit before sunset. Um, and this is just a migrating flock of swifts. So you're never really sure exactly if you're dealing with um, birds that are gonna stay here or if they're just moving through. Usually at the very beginning, you're dealing with a larger flock, um, but given kind of the weather, they might move through a little bit more quickly. They might not hang out here. So you're never quite sure, um, you know, when you're gonna get to see thousands of birds go into the chimney. But usually it's, this chimney is a very popular spot and there's at least a pair that uh, will nest in the chimney. So, um, so it is worth checking out, you know, basically from here on out in order to be able to identify the birds. They look a little bit like bats. Um, they can be easily confused with swallows, but they are more like cigars with wings. That's kind of how they fly. So they're definitely a little bit different looking than, um, than the swallows. So another bird that you can attract on your roof, and this is usually probably below 8th Street in Port Angeles or if you live close to the water, otherwise the gulls um, you're just too far away from the water and they really want to be as close to the water as possible. Um, so this is the Olympic gull, which is um, a hybrid um, glaucus winged and western gull. These are not seagulls, despite popular use of the word. And the reason that we're, as birders, you try to dissuade people from using the word sea seagulls is because there are many gulls, like the ringbill gull, like the California gull, that do not always spend time on the sea. And in fact, some are largely all inland. So, um, so just getting away from that association that gulls have to live by the sea. Uh, this is an older um, fledged, or sorry, uh, nestling that is getting close to fledging. And you can see that it's taking on a begging posture, which you can even see a, adult looking birds do, um, especially if they're um, immature. And so um, this is the same species, but gulls go through like a two or three year uh, period before they become adults and they get their adult coloring. So they're often very different looking when they're immature. Um, and um, it takes them a while, like similar to bald eagles, to get that um, to get that adult coloring. So it's estimated that pesticides kill 67 million birds each year, both directly and indirectly. So if you're not interested in having gulls nest on your roof, or you're not interested in having your chimney left open, and it has to be like a chimney without a liner of, you know, usually like an older brick chimney. If you're not interested in shutting the flu and making that as available habitat to the Vox's Swift, um, one huge thing that you can do is simply don't use, you know, herbicides and pesticides. And probably to this group, I don't really need to tell you that. So that's probably, you're probably all doing that anyway. And I've noticed from moving from Ohio and then moving here to Port Angeles, that people are just way more conservation oriented and kind of like 
ecologically knowledgeable here in Port Angeles than in Ohio. Like this kind of lawn would it would have been way more common um, in Ohio. Some of that has to do with climate because we actually get lots in Ohio. We would get lots of summer thunderstorms. So it was much easier to maintain a very lush looking lawn uh, during the summer. Whereas here, since we have this um, almost drought like conditions, you know, unless you're irrigating and, you know, having your, you know, water bill skyrocket, you know, you're, you're not ever going to be able to maintain a lawn like that. So it just seems like there definitely is a little bit more um, savviness as to why that would not be a good idea. And maybe it has more to do with economics than with, um, than with, and climate than it does with, uh, with uh, ecology, but you know, you never know. So 40% of US honeybee colonies died between April 2014 and April 2015. Um, mostly people are only interested in studying honeybees. So we don't necessarily know, and there's such a myriad of different pollinators out there. So there's, you know, all sorts of um, different solitary bees like the mason bee that are hugely important ecologically, but we just don't know exactly what their populations are doing. Um, they're not just not as well studied. So we have to assume, make certain assumptions about other pollinators that we see with honeybees, which are very well studied, or I don't know about very well studied, but are studied because of their economic, economic significance. Um, so this is, if taken from my backyard, um, except for the picture on the forget-me-not, I did not take that, um, but the other pictures I took, and um, it's been a really bumper crop year for the blue orchard mason bees, and um, we just keep getting more and more, and so we did not bring them here, like all we did was put up this, this was our first, um, pictured here is our first uh, nesting box that we put up on our back porch. So on a south facing, like they like it as warm as possible. So, you know, pick your wall that is in direct sunlight and that is warm. And ideally they do like it under some cover. So they don't, you know, they don't like to get wet. They don't, um, they, they, they want to be just in direct sunlight. So anywhere that you have, you also need to um, cause my friend, um, who introduced me to Mason bees, she had a hairy woodpecker eat all of her Mason bees. And so she, um, I am supplying her now with Mason bees, but she tried putting protection on her Mason bee boxes, but the Mason bees didn't have access to the holes. And so they're not using them. So she's had to like open them up and hopefully the hairy woodpecker doesn't, you know, come and find them. Uh, while they're open, but the bees really um, are used to having like a singular hole. So they're not, their brains aren't really adapt, adapted to having to deal with a maze of holes. So they often spend a fair amount of time kind of like hovering in front of their nest box and finding the hole that they're using. So they kind of need to have it open in order to be able to go through that like flying process and figure out which hole they're filling. And what they do is they lay their eggs and then they pack um, around the eggs nectar and then they, they close that and then they do that process again. And so they continue that until they finish the entire um, hole. And then, um, and then they're only really active during April and then pretty much nothing happens the rest of the year. You just have these like you know, these holes that have these little larvae in them. At some point they hatch and they eat and then they continue the cycle and they hatch out the following year. So um, there's various ways to keep them. Sometimes um, because of mites, um, people um, will um, put liners in and, you know, and not have them nest in the same spot. Um, I have not seen the mites on the, on the bees yet. So I haven't, and I keep providing them with like new, new like nest boxes. So I haven't really worried about it so far. Um, so you don't want to use synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, or poisons. You want to strive for a natural balance 
in your yard by welcoming natural pest control such as birds. And um, these are two birds that you can definitely get in your yard, especially bush tits, the little bird that you see um, looks like it's on probably a cottonwood leaf and it looks like it's picking like little aphids off a cottonwood leaf. Um, it's just a little drab little bird. That's the female actually, because she has a clear eye and they build really cool nests that look like socks and they have like moss and stuff embedded in them. And I, I love finding them because they're, they're really well camouflaged. So really the best way to see them is to just see the adult go to the nest and, and then you can see them. And then the other one is probably one that you're just going to see during migration. Um, uh, but this is, um, this is a warbler and, um, and, uh, so you probably won't see that one, um, all the time, but you can see that, that it's like picking little, picking something off and I'm not sure what plant that it's on. So you want to mulch with long clippings and leaf litter and allow fallen leaves to stay on the soil to create cover for overwintering insects. So essentially what I kind of do is I try to like not clean up in the fall and just kind of wait as late as I can until the spring. So I like things kind of neat. So sometimes that's hard. So it really just depends on, you know, the habitat value. And I just try to keep that in mind. Um, this is a species that I always welcome to my yard. This is a hermit thrush. Um, they're right now singing up at high elevation and they have just this ethereal, beautiful song. And um, so they're back on habitat up in the mountains, but during the winter, they come down low and they can be um, visitors in our yard. So you wanna leave shrubs unpruned, leave seed heads and flower stalks on perennials to provide food cover and habitat in the winter. And so here's just a couple other um, birds that um, populate my yard during the winter, the black capped chickadee and the beautiful, this is a male varied thrush. So it, the varied thrush is in the same family as the robin and the hermit thrush that we saw just before. Oops. So um, everyone of course wants to attract California quail because who wouldn't want to, they're beautiful birds. Uh, much more common in squim. Um, I have seen them uh, usually kind of in above Lauridson in Port Angeles. Um, and then also I've seen them at Francis Street Park, but um, not as common and I've never had them in my yard. I wish I, I wish I could have them in my yard, but you probably have a few too many cats and things that are going to um, things that are going to probably catch them because they are very much ground dwellers. But if you if you are lucky enough and you do have California quail, you can um, make a dust bath and remove lawn um, incrementally. And so um, I've actually seen them, yeah, just in people's lawns where they have a project going on or something and the quails will take advantage and take a little dust bath. You can also create brush or rock piles to help provide cover and nest sites for birds and other small creatures. So some of the birds that really love um, these kind of um, uh, debris piles include the wrens. So at the top is a house wren or, oh wait, no, I think that's actually, I think that's, sorry, I think that's actually a Pacific wren. And then on the bottom is a Buick's wren. And these are both um, birds that you can have um, in your yard. Um, the Pacific Wren and the House Wren look very similar, and you can also get a um, House Wren in certain places, although the Pacific Wren in general is more like the rainforest bird that you, um, that you have um, much more commonly here. So birds seek shelter in mature trees, evergreen vegetation, dense shrubs, thickets, or bramble patches. And here's some birds that you, you know, definitely are not going to probably attract based on uh, bird feeding, but you might very easily attract based on habitat type. So the brown creeper is on the far left, and I've seen the creeper um, attracted to our redwood tree that's about probably at least 30 years old, if not 50 years old. And then um, Buick's wren. 
uh, we have definitely a pair of nesting Buicks wrens. I love them, but they are egg suckers. They will suck the eggs of other songbirds. So um, that probably might explain why I don't really have a lot of other songbirds um, uh, nesting near them because they don't probably don't want their eggs to become victim to the egg suckers. Um, and then speaking of sucker is the sap sucker, which is on the far right, which is a woodpecker species. And all of those holes were drilled by the sap sucker. This is obviously a very productive um, sap bearing tree. And um, they are very loyal to um, good sources of sap and um, often over winter, like in, in a cedar tree, they love cedar trees because they can get sap from the cedar trees and the cedar trees provide really good shelter for them. Um, but they also love fruit trees. They can't really like hide in the fruit trees, but they can definitely um, visit them because of their sap. So on the um, west side of Port Angeles, uh, I was on the lookout for a less common um, a yellow bellied sap sucker that um, had been seen. And um, I only found red breasted, so the the more common species shown here. And um, it was really interesting, like looking for a sap sucker, you know, and seeing like what kind of um, habitat they really liked. And they really love the fruit trees and the cedars, I noticed. So shelter can also come in the form of log or brush piles, meadows, including scrub, rock piles, so like walls, ground cover, and snags. And uh, Pacific wrens, like that pictured here, um, is definitely a bird that is going to um, appreciate when you leave, you know, the logs and you leave some debris piles and so forth. And that's when I've most had them in my yard, especially in the winter, is when I'm creating some of those um, habitats that they find uh, really great. So dead uh, rather than living trees actually provide some of the best habitat features for shelter, nesting, and food. And this is our backyard um, a couple of years ago. You can see the redwood tree kind of towering up in the background. Um, these are actually snags from cedars that we installed. One of them has since fallen over. Um, and um, so basically um, my... Um, my spouse used a, a, a pile, like a pile driver, like for putting in like fence posts. Um, and, um, and then, or sorry, a post hole digger, sorry, wrong, wrong location, a post hole digger. And, um, and actually these snags, about a third of them is underground. Um, but we, if I had done it again, I definitely would have protected the base a little bit more. Um, you know, because it's just the regular tree that's underground, not the roots. And um, and so I think I probably could do it better if I were to do it again, but we're probably not going to do it again because um, someone like pulled their truck into our backyard. And at this point, like, you, I don't think that would even be possible. Um, and then um, this is a red-breasted nuthatch, which is um, a bird that definitely loves snags and is a cavity nester as well and that you can definitely attract to your yard. So birds use snags, dead standing trees for nest nurseries, storage areas, foraging, roosting, and perching. And so some of the birds that would use snags include the red-breasted nuthatch pictured in the top um, left. And then if we go around clockwise, um, the flicker, and this is the red shafted flicker, um, and then the um, violet green swallow. So woodpeckers create many cavities for secondary cavity nesters. So I often refer to them as keystone species because they will create a cavity and the cavities that they create is very much a part of their courtship ritual. So they typically do not reuse cavities. So every woodpecker that you have that creates a cavity, then that cavity can be used by the secondary cavity nesters, like the chickadees, um, like the swallows, and um, and they will and the other the secondary cavity nesters will reuse um, the uh, cavities. They don't have it as part of their courtship ritual in quite the same way. 
Um, and so this is a pileated woodpecker um, on the far left, a male. Um, and then on the right, you see both a uh, downy, the smaller woodpecker, and a hairy woodpecker, the bigger one. So you can really see the size difference. And if you notice their beaks, the downy just has a very small little beak compared to the larger hairy beak. And if you were to measure the size of the beak and compare it to the head, um, that hairy woodpecker beak almost would go across the length of the hairy's head. Whereas the downy, if you were to look at the length, it does not reach even probably halfway across the head. So that's just a way that I think about it if I'm unsure, you know, because I don't have them right next to each other to compare. So you want to find and incorporate future snags by looking for sap runs, splits in, in the trunk, uh, dead main limb, fungi, or woodpecker holes. Now our yard, you know, didn't have any, um, we, we really don't have any trees like in our immediate yard, like they're mostly in our neighbor's yard. Um, so we didn't really have any options, which is why I decided to create a few snags. Um, but if you have, you know, ample trees or you're looking to thin uh, your forest anyway, um, can please consider keeping some trees um, as snags. Obviously the big, well, it might not be obvious, but the bigger diameter, the tree, um, the more inviting that's gonna be as a snag and the more species that might be able to use it. And if you're concerned about, you know, you don't want it to be too high, you know, you can always, you can make it whatever height that you want it to be. Just um, don't take the whole tree out. And this is another big like kudos to Port Angeles is I've seen more and more people with properties when they have trees removed and leaving um, and leaving the, the snag behind, which is really great. So you can also create snags by removing the top third of the tree and half the remaining side branches, leave the top and remove a majority of the tree's side branches um, or um, uh, girdle the branches. So there's, there's various ways um, of creating snags. And you can see here that, and remember that your phloem and your xylem, your vascular tissue is right under the bark. Um, and so this is why like a beaver, for example, can kill a tree or actually a deer, a male deer in the fall can girdle a tree um, as well. And then that, that's the end of the tree. Um, so, and wh why also you can have hollow trees that are still alive. Like I've seen that with cedar trees and apple trees. Sometimes they're hollow, but the, you know, the tree um, still has that vacu vascular tissue connected. And so it's still alive. And also just, I guess, really like death for a tree is not something that just happens. Like there's, it's not really clear like when they started to die, it's often a long process. It could take decades, it could take hundreds of years. Um, it's just not really, you know, within our understanding as humans because trees often have such different lifespans uh, to really totally understand um, death because it is, it is just very relative. So uh, nest boxes can substitute for woodpecker cavities and snags and should be built to exclude starlings and house sparrows. And so I, you know, I'm always like walking around or biking around Port Angeles and I see so many nest boxes that are being used by house sparrows or starlings. More house sparrows though, honestly. Starlings, I feel like are more what I see. Like I go to like sunny farms and I'm like, ah, the starlings you know, and um, they're non-native species. They're certainly not, you know, their populations are not in any way in danger. And they're very much competing for these very limited resources of nesting space. And they're very, they can be very aggressive birds, especially, um, well, they're both very aggressive. So, um, you wanna design your nest box to try to exclude starlings and exclude house sparrows. And, you know, I, um, uh, you know, do birdscaping and consult with people and I do it just all the time anyway, when I'm, you know, at a friend's house. And so for example, like 
you know, I made a new friend and um, they moved to Port Angeles fairly recently and they had some nest boxes up that, you know, obviously like house sparrows have been nesting there for a while. And um, we were able to put some hole covers on the nest box. They're actually, she's good, a good woodworker. So she's actually kind of did it all herself with other people. I've, you know, help, helped out with uh, hole protectors which I don't make, but I definitely would like to have more on hand. So I definitely need to get some help with some woodworking friends. Um, but yeah, you can put basically just a block of wood over the existing hole. And that's a great way to like repurpose your box. Um, you know, it might take more than that, but um, you know, that's like a first step is just getting the hole size, the right size. Um, also like the overhang on the roof is helpful for certain birds and keeping out certain birds. You never want to have a perch, never, ever, like all these birds. And that's why I included this slide, the nuthatch on the left, the, um, chestnut back chickadee in the middle and the violet green swallow on the right. Notice that there's no perches on those boxes and the birds are all fine clinging to them. So, um, also the perches, predatory birds, uh, like jays can can then land on the box and get at nestlings. So it's really important to not have a perch. So I just want you to think about for a moment how the concept of a birdhouse is different than a nest box. So just kind of, I'm gonna keep talking, but I just want you to kind of think about that and um, how those how those two ideas are a little bit different. So house sparrows can fit through entrance holes as small as one and a quarter inch and perches on birdhouses, as I said, encourage predators. So um, this is just showing you like kind of how, um, you know, this ne nest box on the left is in need of a hole protector. And then the nest box on the right, well, it needs to, you need to get rid of that perch and probably you need some kind of hole protector as well. So um, I, th now the Dungeons River Audubon Center, because they're under construction and they're building a new center, they do not have um, uh, their normal, everything's like in storage. So they don't have the violet green swallow nest boxes that they normally do. But if you go to the Seattle Audubon, you can order a violet green swallow nest box from them. And that's what I really recommend because there's just not really good designs online. Um, and really this oval hole that you see the little nestling um, keeping its head out of. And these are all pictures that I took of um, the violet green swallows. Um, they have been the biggest joy. Um, they're like my kids or my pets. Like um, I, it took me years to figure out where to put the nest box. And I finally figured out that the key is the open airway. And so I'm really good at like, at this point, looking at a house and being like, yeah, put your nest box there. Um, from experimenting on, at my own house, um, you know, it's not like, you know, that the box is facing north, which is not even recommended. It's not even that high. It's in a fairly like tra high traffic zone. It's like basically right over my front door, but it works for them. And they have successfully fledged young the last two years. And they're uh, currently building um, a nest in the box again this year. So um, once they adopt a home, um, it's oftentimes then they will keep coming back. So there is a little bit of maintenance involved. You do have to clean the boxes uh, yearly. Um, and what I did last time, which seemed to work really well, is I just took it down. And then I just, I just basically poured like, I think like six or eight batches of hot water um, into the into the nest box until I felt like it was like pretty well clean. Um, so that's how I cleaned it um, this time. And one thing I noticed that, and maybe this was happening in the past and I didn't notice, but the um, one of the, I probably the male because the male is the one who like kind of finds the nest box, defends the next box. And that's the only kind of territory that 
as violet green swallows that they really do because they eat insects so they don't really have to be territorial you know they just all kind of um eat insects together but they are territorial about where they nest and so um the male usually adopts the nest box and i think he was even roosting in it um because i noticed him like going in at night and um and so i think he was actually roosting in there uh it'd be great to have a a nest cam so i could say for sure um and then basically then a female you know selects who to mate with kind of based on the nest box so if she likes the nest box you know like that's who she's gonna um probably decide to be her mate um for that season and so um so anyway i don't really understand that whole process i just know there's a lot of chitter chatter april is about like conversation and there's a lot of like house hunting and conversation and a lot happens and then eventually it all gets figured out and they move in and so um so it's it's a really fun time of year if you walk anywhere around port angeles you see violet green swallows looking for a place place right now looking for some uh appropriate nest boxes for them so a properly built nest box should be placed with regard to habitat features careful observation, as well as trial and error. Um, these are some boxes that, um, the box on the left is on uh, my parents' and neighbor's house. And um, I've had that location scoped out for a while. Um, I made my move when new neighbors moved in and I was like right there and I told them all about it. And they, they now love, they love the violet green swallows and they send me photos and they're like super into it. They even got another nest box. And then, um, and then the the one on the right is one that I put up at my parents' house when they were on vacation. So, um, and that one's had actually it's had chickadees. So the chickadees really take into that box, um, both black cap and chestnut backed. So um, in my yard, I'm happy to report that I've had 90 plus bird species recorded from our yard at approximately West Third and Cherry Street, including this uh, orange crown warbler. And these are just some photos of some birds that haven't appeared anywhere else in my slideshow, but I thought were kind of fun. So um, Stellar Shea, and then um, uh, Western Tanager, this is a female. Um, the Red-Breasted Nuthatch, which I have, but I just love them. And then um, Willow Flycatcher, which was a really good find in our yard. So edge habitat creates better bird habitat. And so I'm gonna compare my house, which is the one on the left, um, to another house, which is just right down the street on third. And just talk about like some of the differences. So this is the house that's down the street. It has mostly house sparrows. It's literally like house sparrow zone. And then our feeders are just down the street and like there is, probably one pair of house sparrows that are always trying to get into our violet green swallow nest box, but they can't get in. So they usually give up pretty quickly. Uh, this is a view from on top of the redwood tree. So just a different perspective. So you can see how kind of close we are to the water, the house um, on the right there, um, the light blue house has had the gulls, um, although they put up a bunch of razor wire. So I don't know not sure what's going on with the gulls this year, but it's kind of sad because I don't know, I'm kind of like torn because I mean, I don't really like them like swooping down at me and freaking out and like waking me up, you know, at like five in the morning. But on the other hand, like they've just nested there like every year. So like they were there before I moved in. So I don't know, I'm kind of torn about it. Um, but basically we have gotten rid of all of our lawn. So you can see the picture on the right no lawn which all we had was lawn so this has been like since 2013 getting rid of lawn um so it's now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing to make a difference so this is comparing 2013 to 2020 i need to do like a 2021 because now we um put a different uh roof on our shed back there um but you can just see like basically surrounding the shed was a sea of Himalayan blackberry and mixed in there was mock orange and elderberry which we've kind of tried to like salvage 
and, and transplant and move to other locations on the back slope. Um, it was also like a total trash heap because it's at the end of an alley. And so there was like car parts and furniture and toys and pots. And I mean, just, you know, just a lot of uh, trips to the dump. Um, and also just honestly, it was in our trash can. So um, it was a big project and there's actually a lot of space um, that was on our property because we had our property surveyed. Um, and so, yeah, we're just trying to take advantage of every square inch and get as, um, as much biodiversity as possible in a small space. So one of the things that is kind of like, I don't know, I, my parents have a laurel hedge and it does have a lot of positive features. It cuts down on sound. You can grow it a lot higher than you would ever want a fence um, for privacy. Um, it actually, the hummingbirds go to the flowers. Um, but on the negative, it's extremely invasive. Um, it almost has to be dealt with every year if you want to keep it under control. Um, the roots go everywhere and make it very hard to garden nearby. So anyway, we decided um, in conjunction with our neighbors, because it was mostly on their property, to have the laurel hedge removed and now there's a fence. And so, um, you know, I'm a little torn on it, but they definitely have way more space in their backyard um, post, post, uh, post laurel. So um, this is then post fence. So you can see the white fence in the background. And then we actually, this, the photo on the right, you can see that was all Himalayan blackberry, like where we were standing used to be Himalayan blackberry. And so we were able to kind of um, terrace the back a bit in order to like kind of um, grow our yard. Um, and that's still all on our property. And um, actually part of the redwood is on our property too. And then um, back to the photo on the left, this is putting in um, basically mature blueberries that we got from Blueberry Haven um, that we were really fortunate that they delivered to our house and they got those those shrubs out with a backhoe. So we got to start out with really nice, big, um, tall um, blueberries. And so we've had just bumper blueberry crops basically um, every year since then. So that's been really exciting. Now this is the front yard and this is more recent. So this is just this past year, kind of like in conjunction with the pandemic, we got rid of all the front lawn. And so, um, and so this kind of like, um, using a cardboard and mulch uh, it was new for us. Like mostly Lindsay had double dug uh, much of the rest of the yard, which is very high intensity, but then it allows you to use the space immediately. This, you have to be a little bit more patient. Um, there's um, some great big pieces of cardboard at Angelus Millworks. If you go to the very back, they have these amazing large pieces of cardboard, which really makes this process a lot easier. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, you put it, put it down over the grass and then you cover it with a certain amount of mulch and then you wait like at least a year, um, before you plant anything so that you don't have grass coming up. And there's still a little bit of grass coming up, but mostly it's weeds, mostly like, um, new trees love to start growing in mulch. Um, they would never have been able to get going in grass because it's too competitive. So, you know, there's still some weeding, but it's very minimal. Um, and I don't have to mow the lawn or do any of that stuff, which is, which is great. So um, now there's like a new area in order to plant. So I'm excited. Um, these are some natives that I started from seed. Um, there's a uh, pearly everlasting, um, which I highly recommend. Very easy to grow from seed. Um, and um, and you can get native seed from a couple different sources. I would definitely check Inside Passage and check their seed supply. They're out of Port Townsend. Forrest is the, um, is the one who um, collects the seed and it's his company. And he does a really great job and I've ordered a lot of seed from him. So adding mulch in landscaped areas is one of the most beneficial things you can do for your plants. And you can get really lucky and under the right circumstances, 
you can get a flush of morels, which um, uh, happened to us one year. And we were very excited. That was the most morels I've ever seen on the Olympic Peninsula. So you want to kill a lawn with a sharp shovel and keep dirt patches open with a hoe. And this comes from Steve Solomon's Gardening When It Counts, which is um, definitely um, my uh, spouse. He does like all the kind of like serious soil labor. Um, and I get to do the fun part, which is, um, you know, figure out the plants and the seeds and grow things out. And so, um, so I'm very thankful because otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, you know, I, I don't know where I'd be if it weren't for him and all of his labor. So in 2020, we removed all of our lawn and that was super exciting. So this is the backyard. And basically, um, yeah, we have a lot more room for vegetables. And so um, very exciting. So now we're gonna move on to really quickly, we're gonna do invasive plants. Um, and so I'm going to try to go fast. So an estimated 85% of invasive woody plants in wild areas originally escape from home gardens. So we've got butterfly bush on the left, scotch broom on the right. Um, invasive weeds like English ivy are considered to be the second most important threat to biodiversity after habitat destruction. Um, so this is English ivy on the right, one of my nemesis plants. Uh, you want to look for invasive butterfly bush from Railroad Bridge in Dungeness River gravel bars and talk to River Center staff. It's really easy to see from the bridge. Uh, Scotch broom is found in disturbed areas and along roadsides. The seed pods eject seeds up to 20 feet away. English ivy can suffocate trees and will form a dense ground cover that excludes all other plants, creating an ivy desert. And actually, we been removing ivy from our back slope and Pacific water leaf, which is this really pretty native, is actually growing underneath. So all we had to do was kind of like fold back the ivy and then all the Pacific water leaf is just going gangbusters now. So that's been really cool to see. Um, so Himalayan blackberry, like I said before, and then evergreen blackberry form thick stands of impenetrable shrubs, which exclude all other plants. This is me with what's called a, a, a root crown you really need to get that root crown out. And what's great is that you get the root crown out and then that's the end of the, that's the end of the shrub. So it's really great. Um, this one is not so great. There's nothing great about this one. The hedge false bindweed and the short stalk false bindweed can smother both herbaceous and woody plant species. This is our nemesis plant. Like even a tiny little piece of root will start a new plant and we're just going to be battling this one probably for the rest of our lives. I just, it just comes in from the neighbor's yards. So unless we can really hit it um, on all adjacent properties, it's just there. So knotweed spreads by rhizomes and seeds clogging waterways. This one's, this one's highly noxious. Uh, English holly is one of the most common invasive species found in urban forests and can be spread from miles away. European hawthorn creates dense thickets in disturbed areas. Cotone aster, I call it Cotone disaster, uh, displaces native shrubs and is found all over Port Angeles. Spurge laurel will establish in the shady forest understory where it competes with native vegetation. English laurel grows and reproduces in the forest environment and competes with native species. Portuguese, Portugal laurel is uh, able to reproduce in the forest understory in low light conditions competing with and displacing native species when established. So you wanna transplant unwanted or overgrown sword ferns, salal, Oregon grape, native roses, native willows, native berries, or native shrubs on forested tracts of land with permission. This is gonna be the easiest thing because if you do get rid of these invasive species that we talked about, like the herb robber shown in this picture, um, you are gonna to wanna to replace it with something. So the easiest thing to do, honestly, is in the fall, you know, find someone who's got some land, you know, they'll be happy to get, you know, if you dig out a few of their sword ferns or whatever. And then, you know, and especially for those of us in town, like, you know, you, there's a lot of good, like, I've got a lot of good relationships with, you know, folks that live in the county, you know, like, I mean, I've got some things like I can give them my mason bees, you know, they can give me their sword ferns, you know, you figure out those relationships and you work together. So 
So the slideshow information was directly sourced from Washington Department of Wildlife again. Uh, and then Real Gardens Grow Natives, um, Come Fly With Me, uh, replacing invasive plants with Puget, low, with Puget lowland native species. So that's where I got all my information. So I'm gonna stop the share there. And um, Pamela, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and does anyone have any questions? Well, um, while, while we're waiting to see if any questions come in, Carolyn, I just wanted to thank you. That was super awesome and very um, informative. I will, um, like I said, make a recording of this and email out all the participants the link. So I know Carolyn went over a ton of information. So if there's something you didn't catch, no worries. Hopefully you can catch it um, off the recording. So um, again, Carolyn, thank you very much. And I, maybe we'll just give it another minute or so and see if there's any questions. Awesome. Carolyn, I have a question. Um, yeah, sure, Rose. On some of those invasive species, I noticed yeah. that there were berries. Are those not attractive to any of your native uh, birds? Well, they are attractive. Um, the problem is, is that they're generally, they're not as nutritious. So, um, you know, the birds will eat what is available, especially like robins and, you know, some species that like come in in large numbers, like wax wings. So they will come in and like eat. And unfortunately our mountain ash trees that we have in town are more invasive. They're not the same as like the native mountain ashes that we have in the mountains. Um, so I found those in my yard. Um, and then the yeah, a lot of them, as you pointed out, Rose, are berries, and that's how and that's how they get spread. So it seems a little counterproductive because it's like, well, wait a minute, like, or counterintuitive, like, why are the birds eating the berries? Like, isn't that good? Um, but my understanding is that just nutritionally, um, they tend to not be as nutritious as um, as some of the native alternatives. Um, so that's okay. That's Plus they're yeah. spreading them from, from neighbors yes. to your Yeah, yard. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the birds are, yeah, yeah. Um, part, yeah, that definitely that is going on as well. Good, thank Wait. you for an informative talk. Oh, thank you for joining again. And then I just wanna read a couple comments. Um, so from Dan, Excellent information. I look forward to incorporating this into my landscape. Thank you. So thank you. And then from Pamela, thanks. I'll take uh, more notes on the recording. Got to run, more work to do. I know, right? Like, yeah, we should, like, why aren't we working now? Um, good info on nest boxes. Great. Okay, yeah. Um, feel free to email me, tours at experienceolympic.com um, if you have any questions about any of this stuff. Um, and my company's name is Experience Olympic. If you don't remember the email, you can just Google me, Experience Olympic, and I'm happy to answer any questions about birdscaping. Awesome. Thanks so much, Carolyn. All right. Look for an email from me. Thank you, guys. Bye. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day.